You're welcome to my channel. Today I'll be talking about transverse myelitis. Transverse myelitis is a rare acquired inflammatory disease of the spinal cord. It is an acute and accelerated neuroimmune disorder that damages the myelin. The myelin is the insulating material covering the nerve cell fibers. When it comes to transverse myelitis, there will be an interruption or conduction of impulses through the spinal cord transverse section. The inflammatory process will cause swelling across both sides of one level or segment of the spinal cord. What are the possible causes of transverse myelitis? Could be idiopathic, that is unknown cause. When we don't know the cause, we give it another name known as idiopathic. Might be post infectious complication or autoimmune process leading to this, or secondary transverse myelitis can exist. And under what condition can we have that? We know in a bit. Okay, secondary transverse myelitis could be secondary to systemic inflammation could be secondary to multifocal central nervous system disease or directly related to an infection. Now, immunopathogenesis of transverse myelitis. This is variable. We might find perivascular infiltration by monocytes and lymphocytes. We can find a zona degeneration or a mixed inflammatory disorder affecting the neurons axons with good dendrocytes or myelin. Also can occur in post-vaccination with lymphocytic infiltration with demyelination and azonal loss. This association is very low, but it is a possibility, meaning post-vaccination transverse myelitis is low, but it's possible. Onto attack bodies have been implicated in neuromyelitis optical spectrum disorder and in recurrent transverse myelitis. Still on immunopathogenesis, idiopathic transverse myelitis is an autoimmune process complicating post-infectious conditions, meaning after an infectious condition has been treated, it could be complicated with an autoimmune process leading to transverse myelitis. Secondary transverse myelitis is directly associated with infection, systemic inflammation, or multifactorial central nervous system disease. Causative infectious conditions could be tuberculosis, HIV of the bar virus, West Nile, polio, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, measles, mumps, rubella, rabies, hepatitis A or B or C or D or E. Some other agents could be parasites like tapeworm or pinworm, cytosomiasis, trypanosomiasis or tussle plasmosis. Might be secondary to bacteria like Lyme, Treponema pallidum, Nicevilis, Salmonella, Hysteria monocytogens, streptococcus, staphylococcus, or atypical known as mycoplasma. Can be secondary to fungi, that is aspergillus, candida, cryptococcus, or cosidioides. Central nervous system conditions that could lead to transfer myelitis might include multiple sclerosis, then NMSOD simply means neuromyelitis optical spectrum disorder. ADM means acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. MOC simply means myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein. Autoimmune conditions that could lead to transverse myelitis include sarcoidosis. Sojourn syndrome, systemic lupus erythematosus, ankylosing spondylitis, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, Peck's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, 
and systemic sclerosis. Actually, once you find one autoimmune condition, then you have to screen for the rest. Paraneoplastic syndrome can lead to transverse myelitis. And in that case, there will be paraneoplastic myelopathy from small cell lung cancer. So types of transverse myelitis will include acute partial transverse myelitis, acute complete transverse myelitis, longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis, acute flaccid transverse myelitis with lower motor neuron lesion. Epidemiologically, transverse myelitis is rare. Yearly, occurrence will be in about 1 to 8 per 1 million. Male to female ratio is equal. But when it is about people with multiple sclerosis, more female with multiple sclerosis will come down with transverse myelitis than the male with multiple sclerosis. Still on epidemiology, a call, that is 25% will have idiopathic cause, or there is unknown cause. 25% will be post-vaccination, while about 50% will be post-infection or post-illness. There are bimodal peaks. The first peak will be in ages 10 to 19, while the second peak will be at 30 to 39. The clinical features will include acute onset or acute in nature, could be subacute with motor symptoms presenting with flaccid paralysis at onset or continuous flaccid paralysis when gray matter is you know, affected or spasticity when white matter is affected or paraparesis. Sensory symptoms will include pain, coldness, bony sensation, paresthesia, and tingling. The sensitivity will increase to touch, to cold, to eat, or painful burning or prickling or aching sensation. And sometimes there will be sensation of a rub in the chest, the legs, or abdomen. In case of idiopathic transverse myelitis, 60% will have thoracic clinical sensory level symptoms. Autonomic symptoms will include urinary urgency, bladder incontinence, bowel incontinence, constipation, and the individual might be unable to void or sexual dysfunction. How can we make the precise diagnosis? The history will be suggestive, or you just develop a very high index of suspicion if there are now clinical features suggestive but no trauma, no spinal cord compression, it is acute or subacute, then you have motor and sensory symptoms, then be suspicious, then have full physical examination done. Now, there is a diagnostic criteria for transverse myelitis. The first question to ask ourselves is, is the spinal cord localized? I mean, is the lesion localized to the spinal cord? Or are we dealing with other related conditions or conditions? Once we could now establish the fact that this is a lesion that is localized to the spinal cord, that is one, then we check for the sensory, motor, and autonomic symptoms. Okay, then the signs and symptoms that we are picking are the bilateral, they must be. And can we clearly define the sensory level so that we know the exact level of the spinal cord affected? And we must be sure there is no evidence of compressive cord lesion. And the trouble, the signs and symptoms should progress to plateau between four hours and 21 days. Then we'll add to lab. 
okay, to make definitive diagnosis of air to lab, have lumbar puncture done, and then go with CSL. On getting there, we want to see the features of inflammation in the CSL. That is pleocytosis and increased IgG. Then we'll take part of the CSL for cytology, part for gram staining, part two, rule out tuberculosis, venery disease research lab for syphilis and fungi. Then, of course, part of the CSL for oligoclonal bands to rule out multiple sclerosis. We can have complete blood count done. Remember, we are talking about infection here, right? Okay, and then we have serum B12 cerebroplasmy, vitamin E, or methylmalonic acid acid. Remember, we have talked about autoimmune process that could lead to this or could have complicated infectious process. So ESR, anti-nuclear antibody, rheumatoid factor, C-reactive protein, SSA, like SSB, antiphospholipid antibodies, and two more markers. Still on diagnosis, we can have radiological investigation done with CT of the spine or CT myelogram. Then we can have magnetic resonance imaging of the spine done. Now on the treatment. In acute phase, we can give steroid intravenously. If that is not working, then we can have plasma exchange therapy. We will give an analgesic, right? We have to start with a very strong one like morphine and we'll give that intravenously, then change to per oral. You may choose to use non steroid anti inflammatory drugs, but when it comes to neuropathy pain, it is better to use either selective serotonin reuptake in beta or gabapentin or pregabalin or carbamazepine. Still on treatment, have you identified any infectious condition? Treat appropriately. For example, highly active antiretroviral therapy for HIV, anti TB medications for tuberculosis, talking of of paracinamide, entambutol, azoniacid, rifampicin, or, and then pyridoxine to help with the side effects of INH, and the fungi agent for fungi, and antibiotics might be empirically or due to microscopic control and sensitivity report. Still on treatment. We can give muscle relaxants in case of spasticity, antidepressants for neuropathy pain, and also for depression. Constipation should be treated appropriately, and we have to drain the bladder because some of them might not be able to pee. Disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs in case of autoimmune condition. Still on treatment, ophthalmological intervention. Increased duration of steroids, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, working aids, wheelchair, and family support for the relatives. The long term complications will be long standing chronic pain or painful muscle spasm or spasticity. There might be stiffness and tightness. The part of complications could include partial paralysis or complete paralysis. And men might suffer erectile dysfunction. And anyone with this condition may likely come down with depression or anxiety. Prognosis. Some will gain partial recovery within three months. Recovery is better if underlying pathology is treated. One third, we have no serious issues again. One third, we have no ability to move around with AIDS. One third, we have complete paralysis. Why some will actually commit suicide?
With that, I'll come to the end of this presentation. Transfer myelitis is a serious condition, and anyone affected needs the help. So, family support, counseling for family members who will be helping them. The next presentation will be on differential diagnosis of transverse myelitis, meaning if it is not transverse myelitis, what else could present like this? Thanks for listening. Remember to share this presentation. Remember to subscribe to my channel. I appreciate it.